So I know that a lot of you that use vSphere out of the box pretty much look like this. I don't mean round and yellow. I mean that you're happy campers. There is, however, a small subset of you that sometimes are unhappy with the performance that you're seeing. And what I'm really hoping to do in this talk is to try to help demystify some of this so that I'll turn you from being unhappy to being happy. And the way I'm going to try to do this is by helping you solve basic performance problems in vSphere. So because it tends to be a source of confusion, the first thing I'm going to do before describing the performance debugging methodology I use is to first describe how the vSphere charts work, how they collect data and what they're displaying. After that, I'll go into a number of different examples of how to use these charts in order to debug performance problems. Now, just for a show of hands, how many of you use the vSphere charts for performance debugging? Show of hands. How many of you use ESX Top? OK, I'm not going to talk about ESX Top in this lecture, but my office mate's here. He'll give an excellent lecture on it tomorrow, so you're all set. OK, so let's dive into this talk. First, I want to describe how, how performance charts, et cetera, and how the stats infrastructure works in vSphere. You've got the vCenter server, and you've got the ESX host. The ESX host collects, 20, collects statistics every 20 seconds and stores them locally on the host. In addition, every five minutes, it rolls up that data and stores that as well locally on the host. OK? So that's all stored on the ESX host, and it's stored for up to one half hour. Periodically, roughly every 15 minutes, but it's staggered between hosts, periodically the five-minute versions of these statistics are sent to the vCenter server, which acts as a pass-through and sends it directly to the database. The database then stores this data, and in addition, the database is responsible for periodic roll-ups. I'm going to describe roll-ups now. Basically, all a roll-up means is it's taking these five-minute stats, which we're going to call past day statistics, and it rolls those up into the past week. Those are stored at a granularity of a half an hour. So five-minute stats are converted. Each, of those, each six of those samples is converted to a single 30-minute statistic, which is the past week. Similarly, past week is rolled up to past month. Past month is rolled up to past year. I'll point out that at the database, these roll-ups occur at half an hour intervals, two hour intervals, et cetera. So if you see operations at the database on a periodic basis, that's what it is. And I should also point out that these occur completely independent of the vCenter server itself. They occur just on the database. OK? I want to also emphasize that the database only archives historical data. It does not archive real-time statistics. Those are grabbed directly from the host, and I'll give an example of that shortly. Moreover, if you're reading our terminology and you're seeing the word stat interval, that refers to this past day, past week, past month counter. In other words, it refers to the refresh interval, 20 seconds, 5 minutes, etc. Finally, I'd like to point out that stats levels apply only to historical data. They have no concept for, for real-time statistics. And I'll go over a better example of that in a moment. Now that we have an idea of how vCenter, ESX, and the database cooperate to store statistics, let's talk a little bit about what happens when you actually perform a statistics query. You're a client, you go to the vCenter server, and you want a real-time stat. Maybe you're on a real-time chart. What does the vCenter server do? Well, real-time charts are all stored at the ESX host, so it goes ahead and redirects that query to the ESX host. The ESX host retrieves the statistics and sends them back to the vCenter server. Note, there were no calls to the database during this entire operation. Everything is handled by vCenter redirecting directly to the host. I would also like to point out that if a past day statistic was generated within the last 30 minutes, then queries like that also go from vCenter directly to a host. They don't go directly to the database. This is called the data feed service, and it prevents unnecessary queries from going to the database. So that was real-time statistics. Note no calls to the ESX host. Now let's talk about a query for an archived statistic. For example, past day, week, month, or year. Client goes ahead and sends a request to the vCenter server. In this case, the request can be satisfied by going directly to the database. So the vCenter server goes to the database, gets the t statistics, and sends them back to the client. Here I want to emphasize that there were no calls to the ESX host. There's one exception, and that exception is, again, if you're asking for past day statistics that were generated within the last half hour. OK? And here's where I want to emphasize the concept of stats level. When you look in the documentation, you might see that a given stat is at stats level 3. OK, what does that mean? What that means is that if you go into vCenter and configure vCenter so that it is at stats level 3, then any statistic that is at stats level 3 will be archived in the database. So stats level basically tells vCenter, put this in the database. 
if you're not at the appropriate stats level, that statistic will not be put in the database. So the higher the stats level, the more detailed information you get and the more data gets sent into the database. Okay, now that we have a rudimentary understanding of how the performance charts work, let's go ahead and dig deeper into what the charts actually show and how to use that information. So the good news is that any performance debugging that you're used to doing in a physical system, all of your intuitions are more or less the same in a virtual environment. I mean, to give an example, it's not like when my laptop is slow, I go ahead and call Microsoft and ask them what's going on. Instead, there are some steps that I go through where I check the task manager or check Perfmon or whatever. And in a virtual environment, it's the same. However, you just have to be aware of what the charts that you're looking at mean. And you also have to be aware of the impact of other virtual machines in your setup because it's not just an isolated environment. And finally, you have to be aware of the impact of other shared resources like the, the underlying storage fabric or the network fabric. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and dive right into looking at CPU and what kinds of problems can arise. So I, depict, I, I find that the easiest way to explain the performance problems you might see with CPU is to first go over a very rudimentary diagram of how the ESX CPU scheduler works. So imagine we've got an ESX host right here. And let's be generous and give it four CPUs. OK, now let's put a VM on it. For the purposes of this slide, the VM is a single CPU VM. Obviously, it doesn't really matter. He's green, so whenever he wants the CPU, he runs. Let's add another one. Whenever he wants the CPU, he runs because there's plenty of, under, of room. Another VM, another VM, you get the gist. So we don't have any kind of overcommitment here. We have VMs, and they can each run on the CPU, and they're all ready to run. When a VM wants to run and is able to run, it is in what's called the run state. And in that state, it's accumulating used time. Now let's add another VM. The VM is depicted in red because even though that VM wants to run, as you can see, there's no underlying physical resource on which it can run. So it accumulates what's called ready time. Okay, so you can imagine that if you're constantly in a ready state, it means you constantly want to run, but there's no resource on which you can run, and that can cause performance issues. So occasionally ESX will go ahead and switch out a VM that's currently running and allow a VM that's been ready to run to go ahead and run. So now the VM that was formerly in the ready state is now in the run state and can accumulate used cycles. There may be some latency involved with pulling that VM in. For example, maybe the pages for that virtual machine are somewhere on disk, and ESX has to pull those in. So that's another latency to be aware of. Finally, there might be some other VMs that are either in the wait state or in the idle state. Essentially, either they're blocked on I.O. or they've, they're idle or they're voluntarily descheduled. OK, so now that we have a rudimentary of an understanding of what's going on in the scheduler, Let's take an, a stab at why a VM might be slow if it's due to CPU. Well, clearly, you're all familiar with the fact that maybe if you're running a job that's very CPU intensive, you might just be saturating the CPU, and therefore you might not see as good performance as you want. The counter that you'd look at for this is CPU usage average. From the previous slide, we also know that if you have a VM that really wants to run, but there's no underlying physical resource, it will be accumulating ready time. And that's logged by the counter CPU ready summation. Note that this should be sustained over a period of time, as opposed to just happening once in a while. Otherwise, it might just be workload variability. Finally, as I pointed out, even when a VM is being scheduled by ESX, it might take some time to load in the memory pages for that virtual machine. And that's called CPU swap weight. I'm going to go into examples of these, but now you have sort of an understanding of where are the places I look when I'm wondering if a VM is slow, or why a VM is slow. Now, I'm going to introduce one other concept before I move to the charts, and that's the concept of resource pools. You can think of resource pools as basically just like an ESX host, except that you get to configure how much CPU and how much memory is in that resource pool. In fact, I borrowed exactly the same picture because the same analogy holds, where you have, v you have CPUs, they're not statically assigned or anything, and you've got VMs, and they've got a limit, and they can't exceed that resource pool. Now, resource pools have the concept of, have some tunable knobs called reservations, limits, and shares. Let's talk about that for a minute. You've got an ESX host here. Suppose I create a resource pool whose limit is 5.6 gigahertz. What that means is that the VMs that are within that resource pool cannot consume more than 5.6 gigahertz. It's a hard limit. OK, so that's what a limit is. Note, by the way, that, CPU, that VMs are not statically linked to CPUs. It's all very dynamic. So that was a limit. Now, what's a reservation? What a reservation means is that under contention, a VM is guaranteed to get a certain amount of CPU. In this case, I've made a reservation of 2.8 gigahertz, which means that even when there's, no matter what contention they have on this host, that VM is guaranteed 2.8 gigahertz of CPU somewhere. 
Finally, there's a notion of shares. I don't have a good animation for that, but basically shares mean that when you're under contention and you have to give away CP resources, give them away according to a priority. And that priority is expressed in shares. And this, remember, takes over after all reservations have been satisfied. Okay, now let's look at some of these charts to figure out how to diagnose these issues. Here I show my virtual center inventory, and, what I, and the reason I explain resource pools is that I've got a resource pool right here, and it happens that both VMs within this resource pool are on the same host. Okay, CPU burn and spec JBB. I also show that the host has plenty of memory, has plenty of memory in CPU. It's got eight 2.3 gigahertz processors, and it's got 48 gig of memory. So there's plenty of headroom, but I created the resource pool in part to show some of the pathological cases we might see in practice. Okay, here's the setup. We've got one VM, which is two vCPUs, okay? And we've got another VM that is one vCPU, okay? What I've done is I've put them in a resource pool whose limit is five gigahertz. So no matter what, these two VMs cannot take more than five gigahertz, okay? So now let's take a look at some charts. In this chart, what I show is the CPU usage of the 2 vCPU VM. It's running a benchmark called spec JBB. One of the things that commonly confuses people about these charts is that if they're graphing things with multiple axes, they're not really sure where to look. You'll notice that this axis that I'm highlighting here is in milliseconds. But the number that I'm looking at is CPU usage megahertz. CPU usage megahertz, the y-axis for that chart is on this side. So any number that I've highlighted for megahertz, you should be looking at that axis. And what you can see by looking at this axis is that as I'm running this benchmark, the VM, this VM is consuming 4.4 gigahertz of CPU. Well, remember, it was a 2V CPU VM. Each VM was 2.2 gigahertz. So we're basically fully saturating the CPU. If you wanted more performance but weren't getting it, it's because your CPU is saturated in this case. Let's take a look at ready time for this virtual machine. Again, we have to consider the axes. Here, the ready time is in milliseconds, which means that we should look at this axis right here, okay? Now, I see that the ready time is 150 milliseconds. The natural question to ask is, is that bad, or is that good, or who cares? Whenever you see a chart that's in terms of time, it's very important that you take the time in that chart, in this case, 150 milliseconds, and you divide that by the refresh rate of the chart. Note that the refresh rate, which is shown up here, is 20 seconds. If this were a past day chart, the refresh rate would be five minutes, so any times that you see would have to be divided by five minutes instead, and so on with past week, past month. So what's the offshoot of all of this? Well, this VM is seeing 150 milliseconds, but because the refresh interval is 20 seconds, the total percent ready time is 0.75%. It's less than 1%. I'll get to this later, but one good rule of thumb to think about is if you're seeing sustained ready time of between 10 and 20% or more over a period of time, that's when you might want to start looking at your VMs and at your arrangement and make sure that you're not overcommitted in some way. Point of saying that is that if I'm saying 10 to 20% is possibly bad, less than 1% is really no big deal and it's nothing to worry about. Okay, now let's kind of be obnoxious here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the other VM that's in that resource pool. Notice that instantly that, and that's a CPU burn VM, so it wants as much CPU as it's going to give it. It automatically ramps up to almost 2 gigahertz worth of CPU. Okay, so now what do we expect? Well, these VMs were in a resource pool whose total was 5 gigahertz. One of them was already taking 4.4 gigahertz, and now you have another guy that wants as much as one CPU. Clearly, this ca these can't coexist, and both of them getting exactly what they want. And so what we end up seeing is that the, f the first VM, the 2V CPU VM, ends up accumulating some amount of ready time. As I show here, it can't be scheduled at the same time as the other one because there's a limit on the resource pool. And so now the ready time increases. It used to be 175 milliseconds. Now it's about 2,000 milliseconds. Let's do our little division. 2,000 milliseconds over a 20-second refresh interval means it's about 10%. We're in the region where ready time might actually start to make a difference. The nice thing about the spec JBB workload is that it's basically, its performance is kind of directly correlated with how much CPU you give it. So a 10% difference, 10% increase in ready time correlates to about a 10% difference in performance. Kind of a nice benchmark for those purposes. Okay, so what we see is that we have these, here's the situation. We've got the two VMs and a resource pool of five gigahertz. Both of them want 100% of whatever CPU. So in the, in the VM zero's case with two vCPUs, it would want two full, C, VC, two full CPUs or 4.4 gigahertz. 
In the case of VM1, it would want one entire CPU or 2.2 gigahertz. So the total that these guys want is 6.6 .6 gigahertz. But no, they can't have it because their inner resource pool whose limit is 5 gigahertz. So that's why they end up accumulating ready time. And if you do the math, it turns out that they have the, the setting of normal shares. And to sort of gloss over a lot of details, in the case of normal shares, it's syntactic to sugar for saying, give them as many shares as they essentially have CPUs. Because VM0 has twice as many vCPUs as VM1, it gets twice as much CPU. And that's why VM0 gets 3.3 gigahertz and VM1 gets 1.7 gigahertz. They're in a ratio of two to one. And I demonstrate that right here. You'll see that before the circled region, the CPU usage for the spec JBB VM was about 4.4 gigahertz. But as soon as I turned on the other virtual machine, it dipped down. And as soon as the other virtual machine was turned off, the CPU usage went back up again. Let me talk about one final thing. We talked about how CPU saturation, which we're all familiar with, can cause performance problems. We talked about how ready time might cause performance problems. Final thing I want to talk about, when it takes time for ESX to pull in, say, the memory for a virtual machine, then that's called swap wait time. And that can have an impact. This particular case happened to me, actually, as I was preparing this talk. I had a VM that was running a Java IDE. And I, every time I clicked on it, it took a long time to come up. And after a while, I was getting kind of annoyed. So I thought, well, maybe I should actually practice what I preach and look at these charts. I looked at this chart, and I realized if you take a look at the y-axis here, you'll see that this swap wait time is 20, approximately 20,000 milliseconds, or 20 seconds. So whenever I click, it's taking 20 seconds just to pull in the memory for this particular VM. Clearly, that's why whenever I clicked on the VM, I was sitting there waiting, wondering what was going on. So this chart's pretty helpful for things like that. And what you can use memory reservations to try to mitigate things like this happening. Because if you guarantee a certain amount of memory for this VM is always on ESX and ready, then you're not going to have to necessarily swap memory in order to start this VM running. I'll have more to say about that uh, later. So to summarize. We know about high CPU saturation. Now we know a bit about high ready time. And again, I, I urge you to note that this is problematic only if it's sustained, OK? If you're seeing maybe 10 to 20% ready time over long periods of time, over a couple of minutes, say, then it might be cause to worry. Other reasons you might accumulate ready time would be if you have transient spikes in your application. What if multiple VMs wake up at the same time? Well, they're both going to contend for CPU. But if that's not happening all the time, then you'll, it'll result in a temporary spike in ready time and won't be anything to worry about. In addition, I've also shown you that if you set re resource limits either on your VMs or on the resource pool, you could induce ready time issues because ESX won't give you more than what your limit is specifying. Okay. Finally, you might actually have a genuine overcommitment where there's maybe you're run, trying to run 100 VMs on a host and it can only reasonably support 80, in which case you're going to have ready time for non-artificial reasons. And you might need to use vMotion or DRS to try to move those VMs to beefier hosts. I also mentioned swap wait time, which is the time ESX takes to pull pages in from disk to memory to run, in order to run a VM. And one way to get over that, which I'll talk about in the next section, has to do with setting memory reservations so that you don't have to pull memory in from disk. I want to talk about one final thing, because I know it gets really confusing. And it has to do with the performance charts with respect to Nehalem and hyperthreading. What I depict here are two sockets, socket 0 and socket 1. Each of them has four physical cores, core 0 through core 3 on the one hand, and core 4 through core 7. Each core has two hyper twins. Okay, So what we see are eight physical cores, but 16 logical CPUs. OK, now we've got the stage set. Let's look at the performance charts. Oops, boom. OK, here's the deal. When I plot CPU, I, what I did was I saturated the CPU fully on this box. OK, if you look at CPU usage in megahertz, you will see the physical capacity of this box. It had eight physical cores. Each core is about 3.2 gigahertz. So the total is 25.6 gigahertz. So that number reasonably makes sense. If you look at core utilization, Core utilization is basically saying, is either hypertwin on this core running? It's an approximation, but that's, it's a good approximation. Is either hypertwin on this core running? As you can see, I fully saturated the CPU, the CPUs on this box, which is why core utilization is at 100%, because at every given time, every core is being utilized. We have one more counter. It's simply called utilization, not core utilization, but utilization. And utilization operates on the logical CPUs. It basically operates on a per hyper twin basis. You can see that the hyper twins on a given core are not 100% at the same time, but take my word for it, they add up to the core utilization. 
So that's how you can interpret these charts. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to add one bit of, uh, well, something else to this chart, which is to say that in vSphere, it turns out that we list, even though core utilization only has a meaning for the physical cores on the box, we actually list a core utilization for every logical CPU. And honestly, the best way to avoid getting confused by that is just look at every other core utilization. It's a bit of an artifact of how we draw the charts. If you have further questions on that, please come find me afterward. OK, now that we've discussed CPU in some detail, let's talk a bit about memory. As you all know, ESX has the job of balancing memory usage between multiple virtual machines. It allows what I'm going to call overcommitment. And what I mean by overcommitment is this. Suppose you had 10 virtual machines. If each virtual machine were configured to be one gigabyte in size, you might think you need a single 10 gigabyte machine in order to run them. But that's not really true, because what you're really concerned about is the working set of each virtual machine. If each virtual machine had a working set of 100 megabytes, then 10 of them would occupy about 1 gig, and you'd need a little bit more than 1 gig to run all of them. So you can see that the configured size of the virtual machines can exceed the configured size of your host, and you're still going to have good performance. One way that ESX tries to allow this to happen is by doing what's called page sharing, in which it notices when pages both within a VM and across VMs are exactly the same. And if they are, it stores exactly one copy in memory. When ESX does determine that one VM needs more memory and it has to steal memory from other VMs, it uses a variety of mechanisms, which I'm going to talk about on the next three slides. Those mechanisms are ballooning, swap, host level swapping, and compression. Let's first talk about ballooning. Ballooning is basically the very polite way for ESX to ask a VM to surrender memory to give to another virtual machine because they're all sharing the same memory pool within the ESX host itself. So here's how you depict it. You've got an ESX host with two VMs, and all of a sudden, ESX realizes that VM2 needs memory. So ESX goes to VM1 and says, hey, dude, can you give me some memory so I can give it to VM2? So VM1 starts to run the balloon driver, and within the guest, what happens is VM1 selects pages that aren't in use, that are free, and it also, if it runs out of pages that are free but still needs to balloon more, it will go ahead and pick pages off its least recently used list, et cetera, and write those to the in-guest swap partition. This is why when you enable ballooning, you have to have an in-guest swap partition. Notice this is all done with cooperation of the guest OS. The guest OS is figuring out what pages it's not going to use and gives them up to ESX. And after ESX gets those pages, it reclaims them and sends them back to VM2. So this is the least intrusive way for ESX to deliver, to divvy up memory between different virtual machines. OK, and it has minimal performance impact, usually. OK, now let's take another end of the spectrum. Let's talk about swapping. In swapping, you're not being polite when you ask for pages. You're basically saying, look, I'm ESX, you're a VM, and I need to give pages to VM2. So what ESX does is it basically just tells VM1, OK, I'm going to take these pages right now. It writes those to an, a swap file that is external to the guest. If you've ever looked in your VMware uh, directory, you'll see that there's a .vs, .vswp file, and that's what this is. So it writes, to, it writes these to this file that are external to the guest. It claims those pages, and then it gives them to VM2. You can imagine, though, that there's two performance implications to this. First, because VM1 has no say in what's getting moved out, VM1 might suffer performance problems if those happen to be hot pages. Number two, whenever VM1 wants to reaccess, when it first wants to reaccess those pages, it has to, VSX has to go to disk, pull those pages in, and then give them back to VM1. So when you're seeing large amounts of swapping, what that tends to mean is that there's large amounts of competition between VMs for underlying host physical memory. Well, that's workload overcommitment, and that will result in performance degradation. And part of the theme of this section of the talk is to show you how to see that in the charts. Finally, we also offer memory compression, which is, which is what we do between ballooning and swapping. In memory compression, what we do is we have the same picture where we have VM1, and it's using a bunch of pages. I've highlighted two in particular. ESX now has what, what I'm going to call a compression cache. This is in memory within ESX. This is new in vSphere 4.1. So what happens is when ESX needs to give memory to VM2, ESX will go to VM1, and it will take two pages that it can compress reasonably into one page within the compression cache. Okay? It then gives those pages back to VM2. Note that if VM1 needs those pages again, it's, fairly, it's much lower overhead to decompress those pages from the compression cache because that's in memory. It's not on disk. So what's the bottom line? We talked about ballooning, which is polite, swapping, which is not, and compression, which is somewhere in between. 
because ballooning works with the guest OS, it's the least intrusive way to try to share memory between virtual machines and try to apportion memory between virtual machines. In contrast, host level swapping is very intrusive and can cause performance concerns. So at all costs, you want to avoid host level memory swapping. And if you're seeing that on a consistent basis, it might mean you have to add more memory or use vMotion to move VMs around. Now, I'm going to show some examples of charts, but I want to emphasize something which can sometimes be confusing to first time users of our APIs and our charts. Host level swapping, which I've just described, which is again competition between, between VMs for memory on the host, is not the same thing as guest level swapping. And if you're looking at the counters in the, Vim, in, in the performance structure, and you see these counters that say swap in and swap out, that has to do with the ESX host. It has nothing to do with inside the guest. And I'll demonstrate that here. What I've got here is I've got a Windows VM that's running the DVD store benchmark. It might be a little difficult to see, but I've circled the fact that within the task manager on this guest, the number one process is SQL Server. It's a complete memory hog. It's taking about one gig's worth of memory. OK, fine. I'm about to, but I haven't yet started a memory hogger process within that VM to steal a bunch of memory. OK, but that's not happening yet. It'll happen in a minute. So the point is, that VM is using a lot of memory. And as sort of the, in order, as a precursor to this, I want to emphasize that at the host level, we don't see any swapping. These are the mem.swapin and mem.swapout counters. What those counters say is that at some point while this VM has been powered on, has there been any swapping? If they are non-zero, it means that there's been swapping. If they're flat, it means that there's currently no swapping. It's a cumulative counter. In contrast, if they're non-zero and increasing, that's when you probably pretty much got to worry. But here we can see that they're essentially totally flat. OK, if I could find the mouse, I could show you that. Here we go. They're totally flat. OK, great. Host is not swapping. There's no contention for memory between VMs. Now, let's go ahead and be a jerk. Here, I show inside the guest what kinds of swapping activities are occurring. Right now, nothing, because I haven't started my memory hog VM. But then what I do is I go ahead and start that VM. Within the guest, I see a huge number of pages per second. I see a lot of swapping. OK, so within the guest, we've got multiple processes contending for the memory that that guest wants. Now, instead, take a look at the host. Host level swapping is unchanged. These aren't the same thing. Guest level swapping and host level swapping are totally different. Within the guest, we see swapping because processes within the guest are contending for memory. But on the host, VMs are not contending for memory. That's why we don't see host level swapping. Now, let's actually set up a situation where we will see host level swapping. I've got the same DVD store VM. It doesn't have a reservation. And it's, got, it's using currently one gigabyte's worth of memory. So no more memhog VMs or any junk, no more memhog processes or anything like that. I've put this on a very beefy ESX host, and I've put in a different VM, memhog, and I've given it a one gigabyte reservation. For memory, when you say that it's a one gigabyte reservation, it means that that VM is guaranteed one gigabyte of underlying ESX memory. OK, now here's the deal. Both of these guys want to, so the memhog VM gets one gig no matter what. DVD store wants to use at least one gig. But what I did was I put them in a resource pool whose limit was 1.5 gig. Who here thinks that's a problem? OK, you don't have to raise your hand. It's a problem. Because the thing is, is that now both of these VMs are trying to use a lot of memory, but the limit of the resource pool is 1.5 gig. So what you're going to see is a lot of host level swapping, because now it's trying to give memory between different competing VMs. Forget about this being a resource pool. You can imagine that if you were on a host and you had like 100 VMs and each of them had a large reservation or some of them had limits or whatever, you can induce exactly the same behavior. Now, what I want to point out here is that part of the problem is that we've got a, limited, a limit on the resource pool and a fairly high reservation for one of the VMs within that resource pool. This may sound a little bit contrived, but it actually, I mean, I just saw this happen in a customer site a couple of weeks ago. And my re recommendation is that if you're in a situation where you know that VMs are going to be contending, within a resource pool, you might want to use shares instead of reservations to express the relative priorities of those virtual machines. So how you can see that in the charts, what I show here are four different lines. One is the swap in and swap out counters that I showed before. Remember, those are cumulative. If they are non-zero, as they are in most of this graph, but totally flat, then that's completely fine. They've swapped in the past, but they're not swapping right now. But take a look at the region that we're looking at. You can see that they're pretty, pretty increasing pretty drastically. This means that ESX is struggling to retrieve memory from one VM to give it to another VM. I would also like to point out one more thing, which is this orange line right here. If I can, again, oh, here we go. You can see that ballooning kicked in at first, and ballooning was occurring in order to try to satisfy the memory demands. But at some point, ballooning had to give up and just give way to swapping.
Final thing. You remember I referred to swap weight earlier. I said, well, if you want to schedule a VM, and if the memory for that VM is somewhere on disk, ESX has to pull it in. And that's captured by the swap weight counter. Well, what you've done there is you've incurred some amount of host swap in. So you should be seeing that if you look at the swap in counters. And if, as I show you here, it's very difficult to see because the blip is very short. So instead, what you might want to look at and what might be helpful is to look at the swap rate counters. The swap rate counters correspond pretty precisely to the CPU swap weight counters. So they're actually pretty useful. One rule of thumb that we use is, let's face it, if you're seeing consistent host level swapping of any type, it pretty much means you're overcommitted in perhaps a bad way. We have a rule of thumb that if, you, if you're seeing host level swapping of any sort, it's generally bad. If you're seeing it one mega, megabyte per second or more, then that's definitely even more of a cause for concern. So keep those kinds of numbers in mind. OK, so let's just summarize what I've talked about. As I mentioned, host level swapping is not the same thing as in guest as swapping within the guest. The counters that you see at the Vi in the Vim API, mem.swapin.average and mem.swapout.average, refer to whether the pages for a given VM have had to be swapped in or out in order to satisfy the memory demands of another virtual machine. Okay, and remember that that's host level swapping within the guest. One way you can observe swapping is by looking at the in guest counters, like I was doing with Perfmon. Another out of band way to do that is if you look at the VI client and you look at the performance counters for disk usage, if you are swapping, well, that means that within the guest, you're reading and writing from the page file, which is presumably on disk. And so if you're seeing a lot of disk, disk access on the host, then that might be a sign, especially if you're not expecting it, that might be a sign that you're actually incurring swapping. So one thing somebody was telling me just the other day is that he sometimes puts his swap file on a completely different partition that, no other, that is not occupied by any other uh, data. And so if there's any disk activity to that partition, he knows that he's seeing some sort of swapping. OK, and in this case, it's a problem that's within the guest that these two get processes within the guest are competing for memory, which means that increasing the size of the VM might be a way to solve this kind of problem. In contrast, if you look at, and one other thing I want to point out is that it may be tempting to just increase the size of the memory arbitrarily, but because ESX has to store some amount of state information per VM, you don't want to make the size of your VMs too large, because then you're going to store a bunch of stuff in memory that's never going to be used and takes away your ability to consolidate more. As for host level swapping, remember that's basically VMs that are competing for the underlying memory. If you're seeing, if you're seeing any kind of host level swapping on a sustained basis, that's bad. It's especially bad if you're seeing more than one megabyte per second. And you, know, you can use DRS, or you can add more, v, add more memory, use vMotion. Those are some ways that you can accommodate this problem. I think one final thing I want to point out is that, remember that I talked a bit about swap weight, where you're trying to use a VM and you have to, ESX has to swap in the memory from disk. If you want to combat situations like that, you might consider setting a memory reservation, which basically says, okay, always keep this much memory for this VM in memory. Trick is you don't want to make the VM's memory size the same as the actual VM size, because then you're basically saying this VM always has to be in memory, and that's wasteful. So it's better to estimate the, the working set size of the virtual machine instead. OK, we've looked at CPU and memory. Let's look at disk. So the ESX storage stack has a lot of different statistical counters for latency and for throughput. I've depicted here a, a diagram of the storage stack with three labels, K, D, and G. These are more for legacy purposes, and depending on what tools you use, you might see these instead where K stands for the time spent within the kernel, D stands for the time spent within the device. In other words, it's left the kernel, it's either at the HBA or it's at the storage device. And G stands for the sum of those two. It's the, it's the latency that would be seen by the guest or the end-to-end -end latency. Now, in practice, in the vSphere client, we show everything with names like total latency and read latency and kernel latency. But now you know where those derive from. So one thing I want to point out, because I know in previous versions of vSphere, this has been somewhat confusing. And I want to emphasize that in vSphere 4.1, this is no longer a problem because these counters have been exported. But if you're looking at a situation where you have an HBA or iSCSI, then you can look at the disk performance counters for the ESX host, and you'll be able to see the latency and throughput characteristics. OK? So both in, you know, for the VMF, for the Fiber channel case, you have an HBA, which is connected to a SAN. And so that's just disk latency. And for iSCSI, you've got an initiator, which is talking to a target, which is talking to a disk. Great. All of those disk stats, if you look at this ESX host, you'll see its statistics. In contrast, NFS is, is a slightly different story. Again, this is different in vSphere 4.1. But with NFS, think about what's happening. You've got this NFS client. 
It's making requests to an NFS server. And it's that NFS server that's actually doing the actual disk block traffic. As a result, if you were curious about the disk performance, you'd want to examine the disk performance on the NFS server itself. And just to give a more concrete example of this, I show my own setup where I show four data stores. One is an NFS data store. The next one is a simple VMFS volume. And the final one is an iSCSI data store. What I did was I went to the host, and I clicked on its performance tab. And you can see that I don't even have an entry for NFS. All I have is entries for local and for iSCSI. So again, this is different in vSphere 4.1. We now have NFS-related latency counters. But for those of you that aren't on 4.1 yet, you note that for NFS, you'll have to look on the server itself. And just to emphasize that, what I did was I generated a lot of traffic to an iSCSI LUN. And when I look at the disk traffic on the ESX host, of course, I see disk traffic because it's as if it's just an extra partition. In contrast, if I generate traffic to an NFS partition, I have to look on the, NF on the NAS device itself to see the disk traffic. I was doing this because I was doing a, comp a make compilation. I was trying to figure out why it was slow. And the partition was on an NFS server, so I had to go across to the NFS server to figure out what was going on. OK, so what do I do when I debug disk performance problems? One of the things I think is really important is to understand the specs of your device. It's important to understand if you're using a local drive that maybe you expect 40 to 60 megabytes per second. If you're using fiber channel, depending on whether it's one gig or two gig or whatever, you expect maybe 100 megabytes per second, 200 megabytes per second, et cetera. In addition, one of the most important things to think about is latency. So typically speaking, if you're t less than 10 milliseconds of latency, you're pretty much golden. 10 to 20, you're still golden, but a little less so. Above 20, you might want to start to worry. And above 50, it might signal some sort of performance problem. So you can use our latency counts to try to look at this to try to figure out what's going on. And in a lot of situations, these end up being configuration issues. You know, maybe you thought you were using multipathing, but you weren't. If you're using iSCSI, maybe you've put it on the wrong switch and it's not giggy or anything like that. Also, maybe you've got a cache and you haven't enabled that cache. I want to say a word or two about units, because I think this is really important before we go to some of the charts. In v so I've just gotten done telling you, oh, you should understand how many IOPS, how many operations per second you expect, and how much bandwidth you expect, okay, and how much, what the peak capacity is. Now, it turns out in the vSphere client, we actually show commands not per second, but commands per refresh interval. So in other words, whatever number of commands you see, you divide it by that refresh interval. If it's a real-time chart, that's 20 seconds. Past day, that means five minutes. Moreover, we show the bandwidth for disk in kilobytes per second, not megabytes per second. And I show this here because this actually bit me. Here I'm running Iometer, and in Iometer I can run a test that can exercise bandwidth and latency, bandwidth and uh, IOPS. And what I do is I overlay that on the equivalent chart at the vSphere level. Now, what I show you is that within the guest, and this is an isolated situation so I know these numbers are correct, within the guest I'm seeing 16,000 IOPS. When I look at the same number in vSphere, I see a number 323,000. When I saw that, I was pretty angry and I started to write a bug report. But just as I was about to hit send, I then thought, wait, okay, don't be a dummy. 320,000 is the number of commands in that interval, in the 20 second interval. When you divide that by 20 seconds, it ends up being 16 and a half IOPS. So the numbers are consistent and everything is okay. In a, some, the same thing will happen with network bandwidth. In the guest, it's shown as 255 megabytes per second. On vSphere, it's shown in kilobytes per second. So you just have to divide the vSphere number by, you know, 1,024. Okay, let's go over some simple performance examples. The first one, I was running a SQL query and I, I temporarily disabled the cache on my SAN in order to demonstrate a performance issue. I know the specs of my SAN. You can see that in the circled region, this is a graph of bandwidth versus time, that the bandwidth is somewhat low and that the query itself takes quite a long time. Isolated setup, so I know that this is my query. After I re-enabled the cache on the SAN device, I automatically saw both increased throughput and lower latency for the end-to-end -end query. Bottom line, check your configuration. Things like this can happen. You might be oversubscribing your SAN. You might, might not have the queue depths on your adapters right. All of these things can cause performance implications. Let me give another example. This actually happened to me. I was sitting at my desk, and I was powering on a VM. And every t you know, occasionally, it would take five seconds, and I was pretty happy. Occasionally, it would take five minutes. And, and I was dumbfounded. I thought, how could it possibly, for the same VM, why does it take five seconds or five minutes? So after I screwed around for a while, I finally decided, OK, well, maybe I should take a look at the disk. Because I know that power on it exercises the disk, maybe to read in data from swap or maybe to allocate a swap file, et cetera. So let me take a look at, at the disk metrics. So here's what I did. vSphere has a chart. It's called highest disk latency. 
what that shows you is the highest latency within the refresh interval. Okay, in this case, that's within the last, so every 20 seconds, it charts a new point saying within that 20 seconds, what was the highest disk latency for that host. Now, as I mentioned, 10, less than 10 milliseconds, great. 10 to 20, still okay. 20 to 50, maybe not so okay. Greater than 50, very bad. When you're at a point where you're at 1,100 milliseconds per disk command, I don't even know what to say to indicate how bad that is. Okay, that's like, let's get an exorcist here. So, once I noticed that, I thought something is really totally screwed up here. So, I took a look at the events tab for vSphere, and what I noticed was that the data store on which that VM was located was losing access periodically. Turns out, whenever I powered on the VM and it took five seconds, that data store was connected. Whenever I powered it on and it took five minutes, it's because it was intermittently losing connectivity. Bottom line, when you're seeing high latencies, it might not just be a performance problem. It might also be some sort of connection problem within your system. Let's take a look at one more example. In this example, what I have is a number of virtual machines that are sending disk traffic to a NAS device, which is a VM on the same ESX host. I'm not advocating this. I'm just saying that this is what a colleague called me and said I'm seeing performance issues for, and then I, we figured it out. So anyway, these VMs are communicating with this NAS device to show disk traffic. So as you all know now, the predominant disk traffic should be from the NAS device, okay? Because all the others are communicating over the network to the NAS device. So here was the problem. One day he calls me up and he says, hey, you know what, I can't log into my VMs. And after further refinement, what we realized was it's not that he couldn't log in, it just took a long, long time. So then the question is, why is it taking a long time? And so you naturally start kicking in your little flow charts and you think, okay, let me take a look and see what resources sat resource saturated to make this happen. So the first thing I did was I looked at CPU. The, well, the first question I asked him was, did you see performance that was okay until about 4 p.m., which is this plate right here? And he said, yes. Well, you know, after 7 p.m. or so, did you see bad performance? Well, yes. Okay, so now that's, that gives us a region to look. In the land before time, when everything was good, there's predictable CPU usage and the host is not saturated. However, once he started seeing performance issues, the CPU usage was completely chaotic, it was completely saturated, and basically bad things were happening. So now the question is, what's going on? We're seeing massive amounts of CPU. This clearly is one reason that he's seeing an, an inability to log into his VMs. Okay, let's go a step further. Now let's take a look at the disk usage. When everything was good, we see predictable, balanced disk usage. I lied a little bit when I said that the only disk traffic is going to the NAS device. Actually, VM, the VMs also have a local storage which, where it sends a minimal amount of traffic. But the point is there's minimal reads and writes from each of these virtual machines and it's balanced. But once you take a look at when things are pathological, you see extremely uneven disk traffic. And not only that, you see that one VM is completely monopolizing all of the disk traffic. It's the VM that's, whose color is red. Unfortunately, I couldn't highlight that because it scrolled off the screen, but the point is that's actually the NAS VM. So what we're seeing is that that guy is utterly monopolizing all of the disk traffic where it wasn't before. Moreover, if you look at the breakdown of disk traffic, you'll see that when everything was good, there is both read and write traffic. I apologize, I didn't highlight the read traffic, but it's there. But once things started performing very badly, all you saw was write traffic. Okay, let's put two and two together and get four. You've got this NAS VM which is monopolizing all of the traffic, and now all of a sudden all you're seeing are writes. Well, that's kind of interesting. So this is where I look, took a look inside the VMs to try to figure out what was going on, and this is eventually what I discovered. It turns out those VMs, which by the way were all identical, were all stuck in the exact same error loop. It was a tight error loop that was writing to a log file, which coincidentally was on the NAS VM. So every single VM is in a tight loop, consuming a bunch of CPU. Every single VM is writing to this NAS device. This NAS device is now getting hammered with write traffic, and that's what was causing this performance problem. So getting them out of that error condition was actually the solution to this problem. It wasn't necessarily virtualization per se, but we did have to look at a lot of these different metrics and then have some insight into the application to try to figure out what was going on. Okay, let's move on, talk about network for a little bit. What do I look for when networking is an issue? Well, the honest answer is I ask my office mate who's sitting right there. But when he's not around, I take a look myself. And what I look for is I look to see, at the, I look at the specs of the device, and I try to understand whether I'm getting what I expect out of those specs, the bandwidth, IOPS, et cetera. And one of the first things I always do is check the networking settings on my host because things like duplex situations matter, whether I'm running a firewall, whether I'm connected to the proper NIC or to the proper network, those all make a difference. I want to add a caveat. When you're looking at these networking charts, the same caveats for units apply here as applied with disk. In disk, we were seeing that commands reflected commands per refresh interval, and that bandwidth was in kilobytes per second instead of megabytes per second. For networking, 
Bandwidth is in kilobytes per second, not megabits per second. Okay. Number two, whenever you see packets transmitted or received, that's within the refresh interval, not packets per second or received or transmitted. Okay, so let me just do two very simple examples. In the first example, we have a customer complaining about a slow network. She's running NetPerf, which is a great networking, VM, networking benchmark, within a virtual machine. And she's got a giggy link, but she's only seeing 200 megabit per second. Well, she's measuring that within the guest. Let's just look from the vSphere API counters to make sure that that's the correct number. As you can see here, indeed, the VM itself is only getting 200 megabit per second. So that begs the question of where's the remaining 800 megabit per second going? Well, it turns out that if you look at the host level counters, you see that the host is actually taking about 900 megabit per second. So let's put this together. I've got a VM, and I think it should take Gigi, but it's only getting 200. The host itself is consuming 900. So there must be other activity going on on this host to chew up all that extra traffic. So what I did is I took a look at the configuration. And what I noticed is that you have a number of different virtual machines and a number of different NICs. And my speculation was, OK, well, What's probably happening here is that you've got these VMs sharing a NIC instead of being spanned across multiple NICs. If you use the performance charts, you can plot the NIC traffic on a per physical NIC basis. And you can see that all of the traffic for this VM is going through, sorry, all of the traffic for this host, that means every VM on this host, is going through exactly the same device. And clearly, this is why the customer's virtual machine is not seeing good performance, because she's sharing this traffic with all the other virtual machines on the same host. If you split the VMs across the NICs, as this diagram illustrates, each of the VMs now gets the traffic of a single NIC, and now she's happy she's getting her gigabit per second traffic. Final networking example. This, again, this actually happened to me while I was preparing this talk. So I was cloning a four gigabyte VM, and it took about 24 hours. Yeah, that's a long time. I'm glad this guy whistled, because I can't whistle very well. Anyway, so I was very confused. So I looked at the performance chart, and I noticed that I was getting really bad network utilization. I was getting less than 0.1 megabit per second. Admittedly, I was a 100 megabit per second link, but still, 0.1 megabit per second is awful. And in this particular case, again, with the help of my office mate, we sort of monkeyed around. And finally, he made a suggestion to me. He said, you know what? Let's check your duplex settings. My duplex setting was full duplex, 100 megabit per second, which is exactly what my network was. It's a 100 megabit per second switch. And he said, well, why don't you try auto-negotiate instead? If you try auto-negotiate instead, then the switch and the HBA will communicate to figure out this number. Once I did that, as you can see by my diagram, the bandwidth went up dramatically, and all of my performance problems were solved. It turns out that this was a very specific combination of hardware NIC and switch that caused this. None of my other hosts had this problem, only this particular combination. Bottom line, please check your configuration. It can really come to bite you in certain unusual ways. OK, finally, we've talked a lot about resource pools already. I just want to emphasize one thing about resource pools, which is that within DRS, when you create a resource pool, DRS load balancing occurs at five minute intervals. OK, but you've also got the ESX scheduler. And the ESX scheduler, when it's doing load balancing, it does it at whatever time interval CPU scheduling occurs. So for example, if you have a resource pool that is composed of VMs from the same host, then, those, then the resource usage of that resource pool is balanced at the CPU scheduler granularity. In, in contrast, if you have a resource pool with VMs from different hosts, that resource pool is only going to get balanced every five minutes, because DRS has to kick in and balance VMs from different hosts. You can see the peak, you can see the peak values for what a cluster can sustain on the cluster summary chart. Actually, this is the theoretical peak. In fact, you'd want to go to the resource allocation tab to see the actual values that you have available. And you can also see that there's cluster imbalance if you look at the, the same page. If you notice that there's cluster imbalance, you can go ahead and expand this resource utilization chart per host to try to figure out what's going on. I would like to emphasize that this chart is actually quite expensive from a computation perspective. So please don't do it wantonly because you're having fun. It's a really expensive chart. But in this case, what you can see is that in this simple five host cluster, three hosts are doing the lion's share of the work. And I specifically highlighted one host that's pretty much being lazy and doing absolutely nothing. In this particular case, the reason it's being lazy and doing nothing is that it's a heterogeneous cluster. Things cannot be v-motioned onto that host. It doesn't share the same CPU. It doesn't show that on this slide, but you can see it in other charts. The point is, it's very helpful when you're building clusters to build homogeneous clusters to exploit the full power of things like DRS and v-motion. <laughs>
Okay, I'm about ready to wrap up. I just wanted to say that for those of you that will get the slides later, if you want a quick refresher, here's all of the, some, the counters that I talked about during this talk. You will get the slides later. Just in conclusion, I wanted to say that when you're doing performance debugging, use your intuition. Look for saturated resources and fight them. Make sure you know that you're looking at the right charts. And if you want some rules of thumb, I've listed some here with respect to ready time, host level swapping, and disk latency. The final thing I want to say, and also I encourage you to fill out the survey, is there's a lot of excellent sessions that I encourage you to go see, and I've listed them right here. Please attend them. Thank you very much.